You're listening to Safer Travel Talk, the podcast to inform, inspire, and provide insight into the world of travel. In this first episode, Caroline's Rainbow Foundation and Safer Travel co-founders Richard Stuttle and his mother Marjorie Mark Stuttle discuss Caroline's story, the charity milestones, and their hopes for the future. Hello, Richard. Hi, Mum. This is the story about uh, my daughter who lost her life while travelling on a gap year. Um, it's all about safety. Um, we're trying to promote safety travel awareness. So we started Caroline's Rainbow Foundation in memory of her. Unfortunately, her life was taken by a drug addict in Australia. So the day that changed our lives. And we want to keep people safe, but we'll tell you a little bit about our story. When we were young and growing up and going on family holidays, it, you know, it was great. I was in an innocent little world of, you know, we just go and we were going for the sun and the beach and to swim in the sea. And, you know, I remember Caroline and I swimming out and swimming in the sea on one of the family holidays. And it was a fantastic time, but I, I wasn't conscious of anything else other than the good times we were having and the beach and the, you know, this little bubble that I lived in. You know, that was a, an amazing time for me. Well, that's what parents do is, you know, let, and do, go out with fam, you know, as a family and enjoy yourself. And we're there because we've lived a lot longer that we're there to protect you. Mm. And that's what uh, parents do. So, you, you, you know, as a child, you, know, you don't think about safety. Um, no, I think Caroline and I were both, I think we grew up to be independent. You know, certainly that, that was one thing that I took away from our childhood was the fact that, you and dad really, you know, made sure that we, we stood on our own two feet. Yes, it's important because you know that one day you'll fly the nest and you've got to bring you up to be, you know, know right from wrong and, and to know what you're going to do in life. And it's very important and, you know, to instill this work ethic and this uh, thing to do about travel, you know, we'll go off travelling and enjoy, enjoy the world. Mm. I think when... The first time I realised, I think, the importance of travel and looking after yourself and safety was when Caroline uh, came out to see me in Maribel. So I was there doing the winter season and, you know, she must have been 15, 16 years old or something. And uh, she flew out to see me for the weekend. And it was the first time, I think, that she travelled by herself. And it was the first time that I realised that she had to take care of herself and because she's my sister and I feel overprotective about her then I was worried and concerned but prior to that because when I was traveling it was always me I was never worried about my safety because I was there I was me I could look after myself but when I suddenly felt responsible for somebody else that was like a game-changing moment I was worried waiting for her at the airport I was you know making sure that she'd got on the flight and got off the flight and got the bus and you know and uh, to all credit to her, she'd done it and she, she arrived no problems and she's probably more prepared than I was back then. I think she was a very organised person and I think that was important, although she only did miss the train in London. Uh, <laughs> Normal. She, she was a bit last minute, but she was organised and uh, her preparation, she had lists. She was always a person that made lists and mm. those were important to her. But yes, I think because you were five years difference, you were the big brother, and that was your protective uh, mode that came in. Yeah, my job to look after her, really. Um, we talked then about her going on a, on a gap year and we talked about Australia and we talked about all this stuff. And, you know, of course, I was you know, more than happy for her to go. Yeah, brilliant, do it, definitely, go for it. You know, it's exactly as what she'd say to me. So, you know, it definitely came up in conversation then, I remember. And... Um, I did nothing but encourage her to go travelling. You know, I think travel's a great thing and certainly enriches everybody's life, or everybody that I've met anyway. I think because she'd seen you go off travelling, she it was something she wanted to do. But she studied so hard to get all her exams, and she just said, "I can't do any more studying." But she said, "I'd like to go to New York because I want to be a criminal psychologist, and New York could be exciting." And me as a parent thinking, New York's not as safe as Australia, where all our friends were going. Mm. Um, we chose Australia. And uh, mm. well, obviously, yeah. obviously so it didn't turn out as we expected. 
She went travelling what in January two thousand and two. Yes. Yeah. So you know, I was nineteen then. Yes. Yeah, fantastic age. I mean, it's, I was. I'd have been living in Cambridge then, or doing another winter season. So I certainly remember us both packing our bags, and you know, I was going one way, she was going the other way. Um, so yeah. Yes. My mother always used to say, you have to let your children go to come back. Because mm. uh, when I was young, I went to Italy to work, which was, there weren't so many people travelling in those days. Mm. Um, but I had that travel bug in me too. So obviously you both got it from me. Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, I still even today, I love travelling. I love going different places. And I think Caroline had a great love for different cultures, different places, seeing different things, you know, real interesting people, far more than me. She was a people person. She she loved, because mm. a, a lot of her letters were about, um, you know, people she'd met and, uh, oh, she, you know, she'd got advice from people and she'd given a lot of advice. She was very level-headed. Mm. So I suppose April time, she'd moved away up the East Coast and made her way to Bundaberg, bless her. And... Um, you know, the story goes, she was, she was, she'd made a phone call to back to the UK and walking over this bridge. And, you know, it wasn't, Bundaberg's a safe town. It wasn't a dangerous place. It was, it, it's, it's a sleepy little town. I was then, I think it's a bit bigger now. And um, walking back across this bridge and got, uh, someone stopped her, wanted her belongings, wanted a wallet, wanted a mobile phone. And of course, strong minded little kid wouldn't let them go. And um, there was a struggle and this guy threw her over the bridge and unfortunately she lost her life. Yes, and she'd done everything right. She'd text her friend to say, I'm setting off back after reusing the phone box. And within those few seconds, her life and our life changed forever. Mm. I mean, it's, it's a while ago now, but I, I still remember getting the phone call in you know, early hours of the morning in the French Alps and... You know, police officer telling me the news and absolute devastation. Just in fact, I couldn't believe it. My brain wouldn't wouldn't believe it. You know, I thought this can't be right. This this isn't right. You know, things like this don't happen to us. We were we were a happy, close knit family. You know. Yeah. Well, I got the knock at three o'clock in the morning, and uh, just uh, two policemen at the door and. Well, one was a policewoman, and uh, I remember see, saying, oh, dear, is it my mother? Because my mother was 91, and uh, invited them in and went and got my dressing gown on. And uh, when they told us, I just remember going hysterical and saying, are you sure? Is it right? Are you sure? Mm. I just couldn't couldn't believe it. Mm. Just, no, it's just... It's just, uh, well, you don't take it in. Although you're hearing the words, you actually don't take in what they're telling you. Yeah. So the next day, I, I think I got back to, came back to England. And I, I still remember walking through the door and it was just utter carnage in our house. Yeah. yeah. Everybody had seen it on the news and everybody kept arriving and coming to support us, which is wonderful that I've got such wonderful family and friends. Mm. Um, but I was just carrying a teddy bear and crying all the time and all these people just kept arriving and of course the media were there as well yeah yeah I remember the mm. media camped outside and you know it just had to avoid them we had to stay in the house and yeah it was I remember walking upstairs to Caroline's room and it was still as she'd left you know it just could have walked back in at any moment it was mm. very surreal and i think the first few weeks were just lots of disbelief I, mean, yeah. I don't think i i really accepted anything at all no i i kept thinking it wasn't true and that she'd come back and uh of course i'd met david and who was a great support mm. and kept coming every day to see us and uh you know when caroline came back to england you know, he wanted me to go and see because I think it was just to make, you know, to see that it had actually happened mm. because in the back of your mind, you still don't accept it. Well, yeah, I don't think because we weren't used to seeing her every day. I think it was you just expecting, oh, well, you know, she still might walk in. There was kind mm. of, 
there was some kind of small hope still there that it was mm. it was not real when mm. really it was it was very real i mean deep down we knew but it's the brain just wouldn't didn't want to believe it was too too devastating too emotional too overwhelming to want to accept anything like that could happen but deep down i i did know yeah well i was lying awake at three in the morning when i got so i wasn't so whether i don't know whether deep down i felt that there was something wrong mm. but she'd phoned me on the sunday and then on the monday it was grandma's birthday it was 91 mm. and she'd had a chat because uh, of course I wasn't very really good at emails in those days, so mm. uh, we luckily we she chatted on the Sunday, and I remember her talking twice as quick as she normally does, telling me everything she'd done mm. about seeing the animals and going to the. She loved animals and the koala bears and mm. all that, and then she'd phone Grandma on her birthday. She was very thoughtful, mm. and then suddenly, you know, in that in that moment, just a drug addict wanted money and destroyed our lives. And you just, well, you never get over it. No, you learn to live with it and try and do some good, but you never get over it. Yeah. So I think at that point, I think it had been a, a week or two or whatever, and we started to think that Caroline's memory, Caroline's will, maybe a, she was just too strong a personality and she had too much to live for that we didn't want that to sort of die, really. And I think it was a way that we could we could still keep a part of her alive. So we decided to set up Caroline's Rainbow Foundation. And I think that was a there was something, I think, for certainly for me that compelled us to do it as well. It wasn't oh, just yeah. a you know, oh let's do this or or it wasn't on a whim. There was something inside that was compelling that I think we wanted to stop what had happened to us or what we were going through from happening to somebody else? I think a lot of parents and a lot of things that happen to people in their lives, you hear them so many times on television saying, I don't want anybody else to go through the suffering I've gone through. And this is what drives you. And it's by being on a hamster wheel, you're going round and round and round, mm. but you're frightened to stop because if you start thinking of what had happened, you'd be destroyed and you wouldn't get out of bed. So that's why we wanted to do something positive. Mm. and uh, try and help other people and we were helped and and driven as you say we were very driven and things seemed to you know go along and fall into place that you know this is something important that will be Caroline's legacy mm. definitely we were I mean we knew absolutely nothing about charities nothing about mm -hmm. what it took to run a charity um, didn't know much about the travel industry didn't know much about safety really and it's just it was a steep learning curve and I, I do remember there was a few roadblocks along the way and a few things we tried we wanted to do this with the best intentions we wanted to do that and there was some things that always came to to sort of block us um, and it was very difficult in those those first kind of year or two to try and find out how we could best help people Yes, I think what was important is we had a lot of support from people. Uh, so people wanted to help. So all the ideas we tried to put in, you know, a big bucket really and think, right, what way do we go? And I remember talking to Diana Lamplu, who was wonderful, and uh, going down to the foreign office thinking, well, we'll maybe go that way and help people abroad. And uh, I do remember her words because obviously she'd grieved over her daughter has um, have time to grieve. Mm. Um, but we had a lot of connections and a lot of help and a lot of people who helped set it up for us who, who knew you know, how to set up charities and it all came through very quickly mm. and then we did years and years of fundraising and of course there wasn't so much about Facebook in those days and so we did it uh, by physically having balls and golf days and and the rainbow came because Caroline loved rainbows and we thought it was a connection from the earth to heaven that mm. we would try and um, feel feel that she's part of it. So over the years, the rainbows have come in so many places mm. and uh, they're often sent when you're feeling very sad. And uh, it's a special thing, the rainbow. So I think it was back in 2005, wasn't it, when 
they uh, laid the mosaic in the Coppergate Centre for us. Yes, I knew the lady who ran the Coppergate Centre and she said, oh, we, we put a little tiny mosaic uh, with Caroline's Rainbow Foundation dot org so people would know and look it up and see mm. what it was about and they planted a tree there yeah uh, and s with a rainbow and we also did a rainbow in Bundaberg uh, so that was in 2010 I think so that was about five years later yes that they in the in the town square wasn't it yes yeah, so it was on the way where the backpacking route is and mm. that's where all the backpackers go to for the information and uh, we've got a lovely uh, mosaic rainbow there. For me, that was always symbolised the mosaic spanning from kind of York to Bundaberg. Yes, it's important that we've got a very special link with them. People on the board have been very supportive and it's been very important. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's worth talking. The, the board members that have supported us since day one are you know, fabulous, yeah. fabulous mm. people. And... Given everyone's given the time so generously and so freely mm. over the years, it's that's humbling in itself. Yes, mm. and of course I met David at that time, and he's been my strength. Mm. Um, oh, of course, taking me to all these wonderful places. Um, but of course, I've done it. I haven't done it as a, a gap year. I've. Well, I've you've had a very di well. I mean, that that begs that, another question, doesn't it? Of you know, different forms of travel. Yeah and seeing it from a different side. Um, but it's been lovely to see different places and think, and that inspires me to sort of think, yes, the young people want to see it and they're obviously doing it on a budget, so it's important that we keep them safe because they're the next generation that are going to... Well, I think um, they, they were our first first focus group was, you know, our primary market was right, we need to look at backpackers because mm. they're the most inexperienced, they're the people that are mm. travelling alone for the first time, they're the people who are probably, um, you know, considered quite a high-risk high, high risk, um, target. And the world has changed. I mean, even in this country now, you know, with all the tragic stories of things that are happening, you feel, as a mother now, I just think I want to change the world. Uh, but as the years go on, you don't have so much energy, but uh, you sort of think, you know, why? Why are these things happening? What's happened to the world? And that makes us very, very sad mm. that people don't realise that knifing someone in anger leaves that family distraught for the rest of their life. I think the, the first major project for me uh, was was the DVD and doing the the time of your life and the teaching pack. That was kind of the first thing where I thought this is really going to make a difference. And we decided that prevention was better than the cure. If we could speak to people before we went, you know, forearmed is forewarned type of thing. Yes, well, after going to visit Diana Lamplu, and uh, we did a lot of, obviously, a lot of television things and radio, um, we found that it was they were doing safety in this country and we thought well caroline's traveling so it needs to be something about educating people because gap years became very fashionable everybody wanted to go on a gap year and of course we didn't want these things to happen to other people and so the prevention was very important so with the uh, radio york they said they'd choose us as the charity so they did some fundraising things for us and then we got the educational pack and we gave it free to uh, all the schools in uh, Yorkshire. So they've used it as a tool with their sixth form. And then, of course, you went out to do the filming for it. And uh, it was uh, excellent because it was professionally done. And uh, we got Blair out of Neighbours, uh, the Australian soap. And uh, he did the introduction. And then, of course, we did all about knifing, drink spiking, and all those other things that uh, are important about packing your bags and watching what you do, all the things that you need to do before you go travelling. What, what I liked about it at that point was the fact that it could go into a school and or, or go to be viewed by students and the teacher could play part of the scenario, stop it, talk and discuss with the students and then resume the rest of the clip or the rest of the, the scenario. And it just opened up a whole host of discussion points that the students would then really get a grip and really understand the scenario that they were they were discussing. And that's what I really 
liked about that format and how we could get our point across that safety was really important. Yes, I think, and also it's built on for you to go and do the talks now to six formers. Um, that's been important because that's given you grounding. I always felt that the charity we had to get our, it was completely new charity that people weren't doing at all. We weren't linking on any of the bigger charities and it was important to get like a pyramid to get your base uh, because once you've got your base, you can build up, and that's what you've done over the years because of your talks in the schools for the education of, to six formers about travel. Yeah, so I think that it was a natural progression for me that that we did the you know the the students at one point could watch that, but then it was it was important, and I think for for the the way that the charity evolved as well, it was important for us to show a strong message of you know travel is still important and it's still good and we were still encouraging people to go what happened to caroline wasn't something that um should detract from people wanting to go traveling it was something that happened that they could learn from to make sure they had a safer and better experience if that kind of makes sense um so for me devising that that program to go and speak to students and go and speak to them in assemblies or in, in groups or discussions or whatever would it's it's kind of they would get to see somebody who had actually been traveling, you know, somebody who had, who had been out and done it or they'd done a gap year experience or they'd done a, a snowboard season or a ski season or they'd done a summer camp somewhere. They'd done some kind of traveling experience that could also share the safety aspects, but really share their love and their passion for travel as well and what they got out of the experience. And it was a way that we could combine all of that and really in a snapshot, you know, I think talking face to face or talking in, in front of people is a great way to get that message across. Yes, I think it's very important because we're opening their world. They're, they're at that age that they think they're invincible anyway. So to open their world, but then to show them that as a safe way of doing it is important because it just it just might trigger off something when they're in that situation that, oh dear, I didn't think about that. And it just might make them a little bit more aware. And as you say, talking on stage you know, to school assemblies is important because they're at that age that they'll they'll take it in because somebody's there and they've experienced the travel and they've experienced the seasons of snowboarding and climbing mountains and sitting on beaches. So you make it exciting, but you're also pointing out, well, the preparation of something you're doing is very important. Mm, oh, yeah. I think the the you know the the lead up to the travel is it can almost be just as fun as actually traveling it's that mm. kind of research and knowledge base so you can say oh I want to go and do this I want to go and do that you can already start getting excited about it mm. and it can it can then lead on to to give you an enriched experience because I always try and get the point across that when you're actually traveling you've only got from from day 1 to day x that's all you've got you know as soon as as soon as that time's up, you've got to come home or you're moving on to another place. So it's really important that when you're traveling, you're maximizing that time because there's some places that I've been to that I know too well I'm never going to go back to again. You know, I'm, I've been once in a lifetime. And because it's just purely because there's so many countries in the world and so many different cities that I'm never going to get around all of them. Um, so it's, I wish I'd had when I was that age someone who came in and said look we, when you're actually traveling try not to waste a moment maximize your safety make sure you reduce your risk all of these things to to make sure you're safe but try and maximize every minute because you might not get the opportunity to go again yes and, and the memories you'll always have are so important mm. um, because you can you know you can help other people you know like the traveling i did in italy when i was young was a start for um, in for you and Caroline to have, you know, uh, exciting to tell about the exciting things I did, um, and to sort of instill on you that you know go off and enjoy yourself. And uh, Caroline, unfortunately, it was the wrong place at the wrong time. But you know, she hadn't done anything wrong. You know, she'd planned her trip, uh, and she'd done everything right and prepared herself. And even with her backpack that was so heavy because she was only small. <laughs> She'd packed everything up and we'd tried it all out. And mm. So the one so. thing that still, it, 
you know we've dealt with grief and it's been it's been a while and you know it's not the time to talk about all of that but one thing that really kind of brings me some comfort is the fact that she was going and doing what she wanted to do you know mm. if a time was up I'd rather it be up doing something that she was so happy about the last time I spoke to her um we had a we had a good chat you know the conversation was cut short I think she ran out of credit or something happened and you know it was a bit strange into the conversation but I would really got the sense that she was so in love with what she was doing and she was so in love with traveling and where she was and really living in the moment and that even now when you know you still get the dark days but even now you it's it's like some kind of comfort that she was doing what she wanted to do and she was living almost the life that she wanted to live she did live in the fast pace i feel that she packed an awful lot into her 19 years and uh, she did love and she loved animals so they were a big part of her life and you know to hold a koala bear and see mm. the kangaroos and things that was just magic for her because mm. uh, she'd had animals since she was a, a little one you mm. know rabbits and dogs and cats and everything mm, so mm. yes too many times walking past the pet shop on the way to school mm. um but yes she did she lived her life full um you know, as a mother, it's always, you know, what she would have been doing, you know, uh, getting married and families and stuff. And that's 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 hard when everybody else moves on. But we do feel that we've got an important legacy. And uh, one day when we're back together again, we will um, we'll talk about the things that we did together. Another one of the big milestones for us was the 10 year anniversary and. I mean, it came round very quickly. I, mean, I don't think at the time it was 2012, and it was we had, we had a board meeting and we were trying to think what we were going to do, and you know we needed to do something for Caroline, but we also needed to do something to move the charity on. You know, the talks in schools were starting to happen. The uh, the DVD was getting used, and you know we we had a lot of information. We'd done some collaborations with other companies. We had a lot of safety advice. We were starting putting stuff on the website, and it was just what's going to drive us through to that next step. How can we take this forward? Um, and then we came up with the idea for the the safer travel app, which I think was was a great idea. I think what was important when we had the 10th anniversary, we, we had it in York Minster and how many of our friends and mm. family came. And that was important. That gave us that gave us strength because there is a stage that you think, you know, can I do any more for this charity? Are we getting f moving forward? Um, but we felt that because we got so much support, we had to keep going all the days that you don't want to do things uh, but we knew it was important and having that and lighting candles in York Minster uh, just gave us gave us an extra strength that we needed and uh, yes the safer travel app was was important and then you obviously had more uh, the technical side and more knowledge and we were able to develop further and I, you know, my, my role had been talking to WIs about the emotional side of losing a child, but you were in the position that you could go forward with technology and, and doing that side and that made me very proud that you could take and wanted to take the charity on because I didn't want to force anything onto you. Uh, and it made it, it was very important uh, and I was very proud that you did want to do that. Oh. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, I think the 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 minster was was an incredible moment. I mean, we were so privileged to be able to hold a service there. Mm. Yeah, and we all lit our candles and all remembered her, and then and and so many people came, and that yeah. that that's a great comfort. You know, as a family, it was a great comfort to know that people were still, after 10 years, remembering Caroline. Yeah, that's very true. And, you know, we still get little notes and emails of, you know, things that she did. And, yeah. uh, oh, Caroline helped me and things that I didn't know about.
think at that age I was I still you know I, I wanted to do something more for the charity I wanted to you know how can we help people how can we help backpackers how can we what would I want I tried to I was I was probably more in the position to put myself in their shoes what would I want now if I was going traveling mm. um hence we came up with the the app and you know it was a it was a big ask it was a big ask to yes. do that and York St John's University was fantastic um they gave us the office space and let us work with the students and we drafted in experienced travelers we were doing all the research so the app basically outlines everything that I thought I would need or as a, as a board we decided that we would need if we were going traveling so locations of airports embassies hospitals um, with all the links and all that kind of information as well as the the areas to take extra care um, the safety tips annual events local customs and traditions news reports um, all of that information just in in one place was you know at that time it it wasn't available it wasn't available anywhere um, and it was I remember being you know overwhelmed by the amount of information we had to gather but also yeah I had this great drive to do it I think and now I think back the the Minster service probably helped on that you know it's mm. because you did I didn't think about it at the time, but I did think that, you know, we we were working for people because of what had happened to Caroline. Yeah. Well, she inspired so many people when she was here. And obviously with the charity, she's still inspiring people because, you know, we, we've been driven to do something important mm. and to take it further forward. So the more we looked into you know, the gap year travel and that sort of that area. We also started to look at traveling with a family or traveling when you're, you know, you're, you're slightly older. So, you know, your travels then came more into into focus of there's still opportunists. It doesn't matter whether you're staying in a youth hostel mm -hmm. or you're staying in a five star hotel. There are still mm -hmm. people who, are, who want to take your belongings. Take obviously. your money, take your bag and... Of course, you know, yeah. they yeah. go by on the motor scooters and grab your bag yeah, and things and like this, so anymore. whatever age you are. So it does make you, I've been much more conscious of when I've been traveling, even in, you know, like posh places, you just sort of, uh, you're still more conscious because of what's happened. Might not have even thought about it before. No, it certainly definitely open, you know, opens your eyes up to, to another, another, another world where you, you are more aware you know, you do live in the in the moment at the right times. Oh, that's what we try and get across is it's important to be aware when you are most at risk. And yeah. if you can make raise your awareness in those times, then it's it's something that can really benefit your safety. It can really reduce the risk. Mm -hmm. I remember years ago we met somebody from the Burn Society and how people just dancing on the beach, you know, around a fire and somebody throwing something on it and people getting burned and things that obviously we don't you wouldn't think about and these are the important things that we need to list that you need to think about uh, your safety when you're cuz you know you you're having fun we don't want to stop anybody following their dreams and having fun but you really have to be aware of your surroundings mm, i think that's important to to just make sure that you know you do not keep one eye on your safety all the time. I mean, it's not realistic, but to just be aware at the when you need to be aware and just be aware if things are getting slightly out of hand and know, have the strategies and the, the, the techniques in place mm. to be able to pull that back. That's yeah. why we always say stay together so that somebody is watching out for somebody else. You know, don't go off on your own. It's uh, it's important that people stay together or at least tell people. And there are more things now that you can do to let people know where you are and all the things that we list about photographing all the things, your passport and all things like that. Those are all important points that we've put on the website. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think the, the website is, you know, some of the latest blog posts that we've put on are great. You know, it goes into different scenarios of what people have found themselves in and little, just little like almost golden nuggets of advice and information that can really 
just mm. save your time. It's nothing, nothing about you know life threatening, but it's just little things that can really help you go. Oh yeah, well I could use that. Oh I could do that. So I think another thing that we could talk about is uh, safertravel.org, which is our our new domain that we are taking all of this information from the app, all the you know 350 odd cities that we've got on the app now, and all that information is live and it's updated, and we're putting that now onto safertravel.org. And we're adding new bits, we're adding new new information there. So it's all going to be completely accessible, even if people haven't downloaded the app. And it's very exciting that all the young people at the university want to do the research for us, people from different countries that are aware of things that maybe we're not. It's, uh, it's great to have uh, first-hand experiences. Oh, it's so important that the knowledge and the the information that we put on there is a hundred percent accurate, hundred percent verified, and it's it's we can only get that from people if they've actually been there. That's why so mm. the, the the university students who have come from those countries or those cities and experienced travellers who have actually been there can provide that information. And it's it's again it's about the little bits of advice, the little tweaks that only they would know or only you'd get to know as a local. And that's certainly true with the areas that you need to take extra care, with the safety tips, the common scams, all the little things like that that really you don't need to think about when you're there. But if you've read them, they, they're lodged somewhere at the back of your mind. Like, you know, I was in London last week and, you know, we were, there was there was people on the bridge doing the three cups, you know, where they've got their... They've they've got a, a ball under one of the cups and they're doing this and even now because I know the scam I can see you know there's there's someone there with a few with a wad of cash and there's someone else who's a plant who's there going oh and he's winning and then there's a few other people crowded round but you know I can pick out the guy who's the plant I can pick out the other guy who's there on the lookout I can pick out the other guy who's there or the girl who's there who's doing the doing the stuff you know so it's it's easy to spot how these things. Are done as soon when you know the technique and you know that that's oh yes no, that's a common scam and I can expect that in this country in this city in this city. I was actually even at my age I was uh, nearly scammed um, over in France with somebody who dropped a wedding ring oh I found this and uh, of course I uh, uh, do you know you can have it because you know I don't need it and I said no no it's all right no no you have it and then. So she said, oh, I'd like, um, will you give me some money for it? And of course, I just said, oh, no, we'll take it to the police. So she took it back quickly and ran. Mm. So uh, and of course, you find out later that it's a scam. You know, I'm quite I was quite naive about all these things, you mm. know, because I trust people. I've always been very open and trust people. Mm. And that's the hardest thing that I've I've had to learn, too. Oh, I think you need to become, you know, horribly more street aware Mm. when you're traveling or it's it's those kind of places and situations busy situations busy locations that you need to be more aware yeah. you need to raise that level of awareness to to make sure you you know what's going on in your peripheral vision and as well as where you're going yes and even your bags and your handbags i mean we've always been aware of people you know pinching your handbags but they they can take wallets out of back pockets and mm. very easily that you don't even feel it mm. definitely and so that can happen to any age yeah. So to me, the idea of starting this podcast is is almost like the next thing for for us to to get information across in in interesting ways for people, and it's another thing for like we were doing with you know on the ten year anniversary where we did the app and we we were trying to um, push things into into people's consciousness. And I think a podcast is another way to do that. People have got time to listen. They they quite like to. Uh, to know what other people are discussing and what they're talking about. So I think with this series, we'd like to look at people who, you know, are, are interested in, in different forms of travel, whether, you know, like sustainability is huge at the moment and people are, are, are really, you know, becoming sustainable travelers. They think about the carbon footprint. They think about what what travel means for the environment as well as having a fantastic experience it's really climbed whereas back you know when i was when i went to australia in 2003 2005 never crossed my mind never crossed my mind what we were doing or, or how much you know the how much fuel the aircraft burns or you know all that kind of thing so and study abroad programs volunteer opportunities abroad are, are huge now um, and it was more difficult back then for us there was only yes. a few 
Well, there wasn't the internet so much in those days, so you didn't see what people were doing and you didn't, um, you, you know, you went to a place and experienced it and read a few books about it, but there wasn't the internet that gave you all the information. And so really, as far as the charity goes, that's been good for us because we can put the information and the research on there. Yeah. So the opportunity with these podcasts is, you know, we can talk for for a decent length of time. We can talk about for 20 minutes or half an hour about a particular topic so we can get really in-depth knowledge and in-depth content about, you know, different ranges of um, of people who are wanting to talk about safety or wanting to talk about their experiences and people can download these and you know you save them on your phone and you can listen when you're you know you're on a long flight or you're on you're on uh, public transport or you're, you're taking a, a, a train across Siberia whatever you're doing you can download these podcasts and and listen you know when you've got the time available yes I mean I, the idea of going on a train and seeing the beautiful scenery and listening to things on a podcast would be great i would enjoy that i think it's it's a great opportunity to see it from an individual's point of view yes yes i think it's a great idea you know everyone we can all have the same experience we can all watch the same concert but we will all have our own unique view of what actually happened and i think that's a that's a great thing when you're talking to people or listening to people talk passionately about what they're doing is it's their uniqueness it's their unique look and outlook on the world that, that really makes a difference and hopefully through the podcast we will be able to get that unique outlook from different people and how they've experienced the world and you know there's a lot of people that have done the same experiences but how there's there's a lot of things that are um, enriched by certain aspects of those experiences and it's delving into that what really made that magical what really made that a fantastic moment you know and I think that's that's what we can you know with the with the length of time of the podcast we can really get into that and really discuss it at depth mm, sounds exciting so I think for for the future of the charity now I think we're, we're in a strong position you know the podcast will be great We've got safertravel.org and I think it's really important is still speaking to students and getting that one-to-one -one time or those group sessions where we can talk about, you know, knowledge, awareness, response. We can go through risk assessments. We can go through awareness strategies and really, you know, focus on trying to help people before they go traveling. So give them the information, make sure they really understand it and hopefully watch people have amazing experiences watch people go out and explore the world follow the dreams and yeah you know, have a fantastic time because that's really what travel's all about so it's been it's been nice chatting mum we never get enough time together and um, we'd like to thank everybody who's uh, listened to this podcast and hopefully they'll follow our our journey through this next part of our charity's evolution it's been a different way of uh, talking about our, the good things and the difficult things yeah and, and the exciting uh, things that we've got to come yes and the memories mm. the memories are what we build up through our lives and always nice to think on the quiet moments thank you for listening to the first episode of safer travel talk to join us on this journey make sure you follow the podcast on spotify or subscribe if you're listening on youtube you can also find us on social media and visit safertravel.org for more information. Thanks again and we'll see you in the next episode.